Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we come now to uh, perhaps the most moving display of the 2012 Scruffs. Every year there is a service display, and of course, dogs play their part in virtually every walk of life, and the services is certainly one that they are important to us all. Our display this year comes from the RAF dog display, but of course we come off a week when the whole of our services in those theatres of war uh, around the world have really had a devastating blow. And I know uh, you would wish me, and indeed uh, all of those involved in the services who may be here, to express our thoughts to our men and women of the services right around the world in the horrible week that they've had. Let's just for a moment show our appreciation to them, ladies and gentlemen, because they are fabulous, aren't they? Put your hands together and express our thoughts for our men and women around the world of the services. Well, it gives me uh, a great pleasure to welcome the fabulous RAF Dog Display team and your commentator this afternoon is Flight Sergeant Arthur Sergeant. Arthur. Wow, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much once again to the Kennel Club for inviting us here again. It's our third year in the main arena, the biggest dog show in the world. We're really proud and privileged to be here today. While the boys and girls are setting up, just want to sort of mention what you're going to see today. Years ago, you'll probably see us all in white hats, blue uniform, doing sacking lines and fire jumps. Those days have they've not gone, but we're very much an operational force serving around the world. So we're going to show you what we are capable of delivering. But before I go on to that, there's something that's very important to all of us boys and girls here in uniform performing for you today. And that is, when we're away in hot and sunny climates, working in very stressful conditions, it's the support we get from home that makes our job a lot more easier. So I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of all the boys and girls here today, all the guys and girls back at our units, to thank you, the great, great British public, for all the support and help you give to us. Without it, our job would be a lot harder. So thank you very much indeed. Right, ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned a bit earlier, we're going to show you a capability of the RF police. You'll see tactical police wing here and our dogs. What I'd like you to do now is take yourself into a bit of an imagination world and pretend this could be anywhere in the world. The operation that you will see would normally start the night before, where as an O group briefing, tomorrow's tactics, what we're going to do, manoeuvres, our operations would be discussed. Gone through quite meticulously. That would go down to platoon level for a platoon to come out and do the job they're going to do today. The job that's been required, the task that's been given today, is to set up a vehicle control point, a VCP, to check all vehicles coming into a military establishment. Normally we do vehicle control points, we vary it so we don't become repetitious. We become repetitious and it's easy for insurgents to predict us and make it harder or easier for them to mount an ambush against us. So what you'll see today is pretty much what goes on day to day out in hot and sunny climates. If you look down to the bottom end of the arena, you'll see a six-man patrol. These boys and girls are from the tactical police wing at RF Henlow in Bedfordshire. The tactical police wing are responsible for any incident in the world. These boys and girls are the first ones that will go in. They will go in with special forces. They will set up an air raid, make it secure and process safely passengers coming in and out of that area. So these, these boys and girls are extremely well trained. Not only are they policemen that can do investigations, arrest people for criminal offences, they're also basic infantrymen adopting infantry skills that will save their own lives and, more pertinently, the team. It is very much a team effort. As you can see them doing their patrol, they're looking through the, sat, the, the SUSAT site on top of their rifle. They're not initially looking for enemy lurking around. Well, they are looking at, but the main thing they're looking for is ground awareness. They're looking at the ground to see if there's any hollows, any bumps, any combat indicator. And a combat indicator is where a pressure plate could be or an IED, an improvised explosive device. The awareness of the team working for each other could make this safe coming in. Right, the team have made a safe location. They are now going to ground because they want to clear this VCP before they come in. The last thing we'll do is come straight into it and there's an IED waiting from a booby trap. At the far end, you see 
Sergeant Hartford, with arms explosions first dog Sooty, a Cocker Spaniel, not long out of training, recently licensed six months into his service career. What Sergeant Hartford is going to do now, while the team have gone firm, he is going to send his dog out to clear the whole of the area to make a security bubble so that we or the team can move in. As you can see, he's a very productive, busy dog. The handler has stood still and he's let the dog work away from him. All the time this dog's working, he's using his nose to try and pick up a scent of an explosive or any component parts to an IED or a pressure pad. Now, as you notice, the distance he's covering is quite thorough over this. He's been very, very busy. What we're looking for, the handler's looking for, is a change in the dog's body language. It might be a check step, it might be a quick a quickening of breathing, it might be slowing down, it might be his tail just reacting a different way. All the time the handler has got eyes on with his dog. And the first time he sees a change of body behaviour in his dog, he would stop him and call him back. Now there is a bit of a theory or a myth going around at the moment, which we want to dispel, that we're sending dogs out and just getting them blown up so it stays in troops' lives. Well, to train one of these dogs, it takes months and months and months really does. We never stop training them. We are dog lovers, by the way, and the last thing we want is our dog, so we've got pride and joy in, is being injured. And nine times out of a dog, if a dog is injured in theatre, it's going to result in troops. We do not want the dogs to detonate any device. We want them to find them so we can bring them out safely, bring our troops out safely, for the EOD teams to go in and make it safe. So we'd just like to get rid of that. We do not like to see our dogs injured. Out in theatre, these dogs have got medical cover 24-7. It is a very extensive setup at Camp Bastion. Right, have you noticed, he's done what we call a free search, where he's covered all of the area while he's static. He's now coming in and doing a systematic search. A systematic search is we've had a security ball, the handler knows it's safe to walk in. Larger pieces of equipment, he's going to work them a bit tighter. Just in case there's a device inside there, the scent may be contained, so the dog may have to work a little bit tighter to get the scent to come out or to pick up on the scent. So this is a lovely little exercise for a young dog not long out of training. This is a very intimidating atmosphere in here. We can't train for this, a, cr a crowd of about 2,000 people in a magnificent arena like this. So I think he's doing extremely well. Probably deserves a little round of applause. As you notice, the handler and team are meticulous. They've got to cover all of the ground. The last thing, if we can't put the dog where the scent is, the dog can't tell us that there's something there. So individuals have gone around all the items. The patrol has made, have gone firm, they've made a, a, a defensive posture. They're watching out, they're covering the dog owner as well because he's not carrying a weapon. The teamwork goes on, and this search is pretty much coming to an end now. The patrol commander at the end is now assessing how is he going to put his guys in here and then set up the vehicle control point. So all the time we're progressing slowly, but most importantly, safely as a team. Right, Sergeant Hartford has, com Hartford has completed his search. <laughs> Straight away the dog handler goes next to one of the policemen and he becomes the guard for the, for the dog handler, the welfare of the dog handler. The team moving slowly, still doing five and twenties, five metres around and 20 metres around, still checking the ground, eliminating and making it safe to move into the area. Once they're in position, the VCP will be set up. Now the VCP in itself is his own little world because we do this quite often. We're settling into an environment where we want to reassure the local population. We want them to work with us so that the future is better working with us. So it's very important how we speak to these people and we treat them. They could be searched four or five times a day. You know yourself as general public, if you were searched four or five times a day, you'd get a little bit annoyed about this. So we have to be meticulous how we meet local people and set it up and get a good communication and a working environment with them. We found the more hearts and minds that we, we, uh, we gain, the pop population starts supporting us and they start passing us on valuable information that's going out a bit further away from our main bases. So it's important we get this right and a day in, day out routine. If you notice from all the patrol, the kit that they're carrying. They've got a helmet on, they've got Osprey body armour and a day sack. When they're out on operations, majority of the kit they'll be carrying is water because they're working in 50 degrees heat and ammunition. They could be carrying between 50 and up to 60 pound of kit. Out on an, out hour, out on an eight hour patrol, four days at a time and then coming back in, in 50 degrees heat. So it is quite difficult working conditions that they're in. 
Right, that's the VCP now set up. The commander's happy with that and he's ready for the first vehicle to come in. Obviously here we're working with a nice modern car. Out in theatres, we can be dealing with vehicles that are between 40 to 50 years old. There's doors hanging off, they've not got tight seals on them, um, no handbrakes, so it can be a bit of a hazard searching a vehicle because it can literally roll away while you're working on it. Well, as I mentioned here, the policeman is building a rapport with the locals. This guy's been checked four or five times. We go through the normal rig roll, they get a bit fed up with it. So this is where it's important. As a policeman, we're able to communicate with people. So he's told them we're just doing a routine sweep of the vehicle. The passengers are being taken away and taken to one side. We do this because this might be an opportunity for the driver to pass on information to us. If he's seen talking to coalition forces, that could be repercussions on him later on. So there's straight away you see many strings to the bow. Right, well, you see now Sergeant Halford is now coming up to carry out a vehicle search. He'll work the dog down low and he'll work him down high. He'll stick him in the grills and the creases of the car all the time trying to see if there's a scent inside that vehicle for the dog to find it. We don't like as coalition forces being on the ground too long. If we're there too long, we can get an ambush. The beauty of having a dog with us, this dog should have searched this vehicle in possibly two minutes. If I was to get this to be searched by a team, I'd need four guys, it would probably take an hour to do it thoroughly because IEDs can be placed in such a strategic place on a vehicle. So this is very time critical, the dog's a lot quicker. If we know there's something there, we can start dealing with it straight away. You this dog is demonstrating a lovely search here. It's very meticulous and thorough. A little bit of a change in body language there. And then he's moved on to complete the search. And like I say, this, this has taken a couple of minutes. Very energetic young dog. He is used to the bonnet being lifted up and jumping up. In theatre, they all have soft boots to protect the feet from the hot ground and from hot engines. So it's quite normal for this dog to jump up onto, a, onto an engine block and work happily around an engine block with their pads, pads protected. He's now put the dog inside the vehicle. The other booty we have, in a way, held in theatre is that say vehicles are 40, 50 years old, extremely hot conditions, and we always seem to have a nice breeze. So anything that's in that vehicle, I've known dogs to walk up to vehicles 10, 15 feet away, and the dog's indicating on the vehicle straight away because the scent is so liberated and coming off. Right, as you can see there, the, dog, the handler has put his hand up. The dog has indicated that he's found something inside the vehicle. What would happen now in real life, the handler would come around and call his dog out as soon as possible. We'd go into an IED procedure. We're not going to demonstrate that today because it's quite lengthy. Today, like I say, normally in real life we would call this dog away and we'd move away, but he's given the dog a report reward just to demonstrate to you why this dog carries out his work. Basically, every time they find a scent, he gets a ball reward. And basically this is positive reinforcement and that is why the dog does his job for us. And we just build up for a few seconds, fine, a minute of fine, five minutes of fine, to, to where this dog can be working four or five hours before he gets a reward. And I think that was a lovely exercise. Right, the driver now, because they've found a weapon inside the vehicle, has now been arrested, will be handed over to the local police. So now this is a different type of search and scenario that's gone on. The passengers, because they've been in a vehicle carrying a weapon, have now been put to one side, and we're now going to carry out a drugs detection search. This is Corporal Neil Furness with drugs detection dog Luke. This team have only been together two, two or three months. Corporal Furness has just returned from an arduous tour in Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, and uh, he's a bit stressed because his suntan is now disappearing. <laughs> but we still love him. Right, as you see now, searching of persons. If I was to ask these gentlemen to be taken to one side and searched, I'd need a four-man team, probably take me a couple of hours to search these vehicles. This dog will do it in seconds. Same with the bags as well. So the, ground, the troops are not going to be on the ground any longer than they need to be. They're not being intimidated by this because the dog is just working over them nice and tight. Predominantly he's working on a systematic search where he's putting the dog on. With the AS dog, we work the dog away, and obviously if there's any device where we don't want him triggering that device. We're not too fussed with the drugs dog because there is no IEDs for us to worry about. So the dog is very hands-on, 
He will touch the bags and go on the bags, but if you notice, working on the people, he is not touching them at all, because we cannot infringe their human rights. So he's working nice and steady. If there is a little jump up, the handler just holds the lead and just does hold him up. Enjoying his work, his tail going very well. And then looking forward to going on to the next bag. These dogs have so, got such a great sensitive nose, and with the training that we give them, this dog's about to say, no, there's nothing in there, let's move on to the next one. They do move on very quickly. Very nice little display here. Only the second time he's ever worked in an environment like this. Have you noticed the rest of the team are still in their defensive postures? And a slight change in body language there, the towel just moved, and the dog has shown the handler that there is something there by lying down and looking at the back. So he's told them there's a drug source in this bag. What would happen is now the drugs have been removed from the bag, the dog has got his ball reward, and now these three people would now be arrested. Quite a real scenario here, because out in villages, if we do start arresting, the jungle rooms start going around, and the local villagers will get together and see what comes on. They get a suspicious, and they can get a bit agitated by this. And before long, you start getting a group that is forming, trying to find out what's going on to relations or people that live in their village. And crowds do start developing and do start moving forward. So before the crowd starts moving up, one of, the, one of the people here, I better get out of the way. One of them decided to do a runner to try and go and warn his other friends. As you've seen, the dog was released, but because the, the person has stood still, using the minimum amount of force, he has done a standoff. The dog has not bitten. Had that person kept running, that dog would have gone in and bitten the person. But because he's working to the minimum rules of engagement, the person stood still and the dog has obeyed that. So I think that was quite a Quite a good little display there from the team. A nice little demonstration of control from Corporal Sam Plant and uh, military working dog Charlie. Sam performing in his hometown of Birmingham and he is an Aston Villa supporter as well. Right, as I mentioned, we've had someone try to run away to warn the rest of the crowd and the rest of the village that something's going on. They've, that word has gone around. The crowd are now getting very anti. Four of the members have been arrested. Dog has been set on them. Now we have a, a serious crowd control situation. The Arab police are trying to hold them back. Using the middle amount of force, the dogs have been pulled forward to restore a crowd control here. The, the crowd over to push the dogs back. Kudos, the military working dog is now pushing the crowd back. The crowd has developed a posture together, and now we have an intruder with a weapon. Belgium otherwise released and hits the road. That was quite spectacular, ladies and gentlemen, because we had a massive crowd disorganisation there. The, cat, the dogs came out, restored the crowd in order. There was a gunfire, the crowd had dropped the floor, and then Belgium Malawar has run straight through that and sustained a bite and a nice leave and come back into the handler full minimum amount of force. A massive round of applause with that. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we have quickly today demonstrated the capability of what our boys and girls in the Royal Air Force Police deliver on a daily basis out in a hot and sunny climate. To the bottom end of the arena now, you will see Flight Sergeant Michael Barrow walking into the arena with military working dog Buster. Now, Buster is being put forward for Friends for Life. <laughs> Buster is eight years old. He's been in the Royal Air Force for seven years. He's completed two tours of Bosnia, a tour of Iraq, and a tour of Afghanistan. Why has he been put forward for Friends for Life? Well, it's not that the weapons that he's found, the IEDs have saved all the troops' lives. Yeah, we're, in a way, I suppose we expect that, because that's what we're training to do. What makes this dog different and why we're putting forward for this? Buster is a unique character. Not only is he an exceptional military working dog and the way he goes about his search business, it's that in the evenings, when all the infantry troops have had a really stressful day, a really difficult environment, at the, at the forward operation bases, Buster, after he's finished his day, would be left for lead, he just goes around the compound and he would say hello to everybody. 
And you've got young infantry guys that are really stressed, tired. It just relaxes them and it just gives them a little taste of home. That's why he's a special dog to us. And for us, he will always be our friend for life. We love this dog. And on Tuesday, with uh, Michael, he travels to Cyprus to spend the rest of his days running along a beach in Cyprus. So we wish him well with that. Well, I will ask now uh, Flight Sergeant uh, John Brown, Provost Marshal's dog inspector, to march on to give the salute. But before he gives the salute, I'd like to bring your attention to Flight Lieutenant Michael Larkman, OBE, at the front. Michael has been in the Air Force 37 years. He's Officer Commanding Military Working Dogs, and he retires later this year after 37 years' service. We will thank him for that, and we wish him all the best in his retirement is in his tax haven in Jersey. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is our privilege and honour to give you the Royal Air Force Police and their dogs. And this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Crafts 2012, the salute has been taken to by Professor Steve Dean, Chairman of the Kennel Club. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have seen a truly marvellous display of dogs from the RAF dog team. May we ask you to salute our servicemen and women around the world and thank the RAF display team and let's stand and send them on their way for the respect they deserve around the world. Thank you to, to the commentary from Flight Sergeant Arthur Sergeant.